Phil, it's Wednesday, man. What are, we, what are we doing here? I thought we were a Sunday podcast, bros. What's going on? What's happening? This is a feed drop, <laughs> but this week, it's this week, see? You can leave this in here if you want, Trev. I'm, I'm introducing it like it's a normal substance episode. <laughs> this is not a normal substance episode. Like I just said, it's a feed drop. Um, this is an episode of season one of our friend uh, Philip Holmes's podcast, Make It Plain. Philip and his buddy Taylor Gray have a podcast on Malcolm X, the life and words of Malcolm X. Uh, as you guys, listeners may remember, I think it was episode 70 or so. Yep. Mm-hmm. We had uh, Phil Holmes on. Great convo. Talk about Malcolm X, the, the life of Malcolm X. Talked a lot about uh, MLK Jr. and just power and uh, the work of those two men, uh, particularly Malcolm X, um, and how Christians um, misunderstand it, particularly white Christians, mm-hmm. um, don't get a full message on it. So we've we've talked about his podcast before. It's phenomenal, and it's coming back. Yeah. So this is kind of a intro to get you excited about season two, and you can kind of get to review. We actually got to pick this particular episode as what we wanted to promote season two, and it's a great one. It kind of riffs off Mm -hmm. this idea of Malcolm X that he always, even though he had very firm convictions, he was always willing to learn. And based on the facts and the material that he was learning in the world, reshape what he thought about something if it turned out he was wrong. And there's an integrity to that. Which is exactly what we talk about on the show. All like intellectual integrity and curiosity. Those were... Those were things that he he really committed himself there, to, and not like, and it wasn't necessarily like it was probably natural to a degree, but it was one of the things that I was impressed by and am impressed by as I'm kind of getting into his life and his works is his commitment to that. Yeah, so we think you guys are really going to enjoy this episode and the conversation that Phil and Taylor have that really tries to analyze the life and work of Malcolm X using the lens of God's word. So. Listen to this episode. Enjoy this episode. Subscribe to the Make It Plain podcast. And please note on your calendars that their new season, season two, drops on February 21st this year. So it's coming right around the corner. So enjoy Phil and Taylor's conversation on this episode of Make It Plain. And after you do, go ahead and give a listen to episode 70 if you haven't yet. And jump over to the Make It Plain podcast and subscribe. I don't see any American dream, I see an American nightmare. We never initiate any violence upon anyone, but if anyone attacks us, we reserve the right to defend ourselves. When you're in your own nation, in your own land, you're in a position to get justice. But when you're in another man's country, in another man's land, you have to look for that other man for justice, and you'll never get it. We're nonviolent with people who are nonviolent with us, but we are not nonviolent with anyone who is violent with us. Anytime you beg another man to set you free, you will never be free. We are ready and willing to pay the price that is necessary for freedom. What price are you talking about? The price of freedom is death. Welcome to Make It Plain, where we offer Christian reflections on the words and life of Malcolm X. I'm Philip Holmes. And I'm Taylor Gray. We are your hosts. So, Taylor, today I thought it would be helpful for us to look at a quote from Malcolm X. And the quote um, is basically addressing the topic of intellectual integrity. And this is this quote is it, it means a lot to me because this is when I think I like fell in love with Malcolm X. Mm. Man, I, I love the way that this, this dude thinks. So mm. I'm going to read this quote real quick. He says, despite my firm convictions... I have always been a man who tries to face facts and to accept the reality of life as new experience and new knowledge unfolds it. I have always kept an open mind, which is necessary to the flexibility that must go hand in hand with every form of intelligent search for truth. Mm. It's good, man. There's so much, (laughs) so much in that quote, man. And I think, you know, as we talk about intellectual integrity, it could mean different things. Some would say it, it just means to be educated on some level, whether it's a certain kind of higher education, in our case, seminary training. Some would say it just has to do with life experience, you know, like different 
circumstances can teach you more about the realities that we face. But uh, what what are some, what, I guess, what are some reflections you have about just intellectual integrity? What do you think that that actually yeah. communicates or, or how we pursue it? That's good. Well, I, I'll just get straight to the point and read you the definition that I found that I thought was helpful. It says intellectual integrity is the discipline of striving to be thorough mm-hmm. and honest, to learn the truth or to reach the best decision possible in a given situation. A person with intellectual integrity has a driving desire to follow reasons and evidence courageously wherever they may lead. Mm, courageously, man. And, and you know, it's interesting because it does take courage because you have to, at some point, admit that you're headed into unknown territory. Correct. And, and you're posturing yourself as a learner. So Malcolm starts off that quote saying, despite his convictions, it means you can go, you can embark on this journey with your convictions. Right. And, and he says, despite my firm convictions. Yeah. Yeah. So this was this is one of the things that I think I appreciated about Malcolm, because I think that a lot of people would be intimidated by a guy who has the convictions that Malcolm has, who was as zealous mm-hmm. as Malcolm was about what he believed. Mm-hmm. And I this is this is why I was so much able to identify with Malcolm when I read this quote, because I knew exactly what he was talking about. Mm. Yeah. I feel strongly about some things. Yeah, me too. Sometimes a lot of things, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> depending on the season. Yeah. Right? And I will argue you <laughs> down. Yeah. Like, let's go. <laughs> convince me. Like yeah. that's, But that's essentially what I'm saying, right? Yeah. I'm saying convince me. Yeah. And, yeah. and I could be wrong, and I'll be like, you know what? You're right, man. Yeah. It's nothing for me on the flip of a dime to just be like, yeah, you're right. Well, you and, and I'm I sweating over here. I've yeah. been arguing so hard. I mean, listen, like you and I have experienced that, like in in charitable conversation. You know, I'm yeah, it has to be charitable. It's charitable, but there's something really necessary to that. Like in our experience as human beings, how we develop in our thinking, how we grow in our perspectives. You know, just one of the one of the stories I remember about you and I having this kind of interaction was we were at the together for the gospel conference. And then we were talking <laughs> about racism. <laughs> and there was who else was there? It was a Sean Marks. Shout out to you. Yeah. Sean, what's up, man? We were just having That's a right. lively. Yeah, I remember that. You th- those uh um, Hey, you remember when that dude walked up? <laughs> <laughs> homeboy great. this is kind of when sort of the i guess people were like planting a foot in the ground or whatever mm-hmm. but um mm-hmm. homeboy walked up and he dapped taylor up or whatever and yeah. shook his hands and was like what's up homie blah 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 man i'm a huge fan blah 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 yeah and then taylor was talking to, and then i introduced myself you know like a normal person would <laughs> hey man i'm philip good to meet you bro yeah yeah like not like assuming that he would know who i was and yeah. still looked me up and down and was like yeah i know who you are yeah that and was, walked off that was uh that was a moment man <laughs> that was a i moment. was like what yeah yeah Oh, yeah. sure. I I was I was so taken aback. I didn't even know what to do. <laughs> Dude. I was I was like Taylor. Did that just happen? That happened, man. I was I was tripping a little bit. Like I was just tripping at the contrast of the way that he introduced himself to me, and then just the way that he interacted with you. Like you know, we're here as brothers in Christ yeah. at this conference together. It's like, bro, you at T four G? Yeah, bro. Yeah. Like. Yeah. Yeah, man. It, but, but that was that was just one of those those moments where I think that you you can you can interact with somebody with different ideas or yeah. you can explore an idea together from different starting points or different perspectives. Right. But it was charitable between you and I. Like, you know, this was like one of those in between main session conversations, like where the real reason people go to conferences. Right. To, exactly. <laughs> to actually sit <laughs> to out see, and, to see oh. the people they talk to on social media. <laughs> But I'd be like, man, I love the spirit of this quote, man, because what Malcolm is is getting at here is despite firm convictions, if there's an opportunity for him to learn something new and reconsider, then he's open to that. Yep. And I've always been a man who tries. Yeah. Right. So he he's even admitting there that like it's not easy. Yeah. Yep. I don't always do it. Yep. 
but I'm trying to face facts because facing right. facts is hard. Facing facts. Sometimes it's easy to be wrong. Sometimes it's very difficult to be wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And and usually it has to do with whether you're privately wrong or publicly wrong. You know, that's true. That's and so for him to say that and obviously disseminate this thought publicly is is interesting. I, I'm also as, in, as it relates to intellectual integrity and engaging in dialogue with somebody to either have your perspective enlightened or to educate someone who misunderstands your perspective. Um, I think what's, what's really cool about Malcolm here in the vein of intellectual discourse is that he is not an academic. You know, he is not a person who went through the levels of schooling that would classify him as a scholar or someone who exists in certain circles to right. talk about ideas on a high level. Mm -hmm. And yet he finds himself in these spaces all the time. Mm -hmm. So I think his background and ultimately his ascent into the place of social discourse and dialogue mm -hmm. informs his posture. Right. Because he's, he's, been, he's already been through so much in his life. Whatever he could have thought life was, um, it faced several traumatic events to alter his perspective. So that should, that should also inform whatever we think about intellectual integrity or intellectual honesty. Yeah, no, that's good. I think tribalism mm. plays a huge part. Yeah. And the role, you know, I, I, I've kind of been thinking through the effects of Christian tribalism and hmm. I'm trying to, I've been trying to answer the question. Okay. So why do most books regarding this issue of race, like major on problems, but mm -hmm. are weak when it comes to solutions? Mm -hmm. Like why is the diagnosis of the problem often incomplete and accurate or completely fabricated? Yeah. Like why, why, why are so many people why are so many of the rather pr proposed solutions either more influenced by political ideology than scripture hmm. or an oversimplified answer with Bible references, but little to no applicable substance? Yeah, man. And I think yeah. that the simple answer is that it's complex mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and folks can't connect the dots due to tribalism. Yeah. Right. Because and I, I think this is why you have so many special interest tribes unable to see the forest for the trees. So we've become so bent on convincing the masses that the tree that we've been hacking on is the greatest threat or the yep. most important issue mm -hmm. that we've completely overlooked the fact that we've set up camp in Mirkwood. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a, and that's a handicap, you know, let's flat out acknowledge it for what it is. Like tribalism is a handicap. You know, Absolutely. It's it's you identifying with a limited view of the world and ultimately in this case a limited view of God, a limited view of the gospel, a limited view of how our faith impacts the world. And there's there's nothing wrong with having convictions that align with your tribe. Yeah. It's just that in the spirit of Christian charity, as we interact with those who would also profess to have faith in Christ, mm -hmm. are we even in a position to hear from and gain from other people who have other convictions, mm. you know, and at least hear out what that conviction could be and become a learner if yeah. it's something you're not familiar with. Become a learner if it's coming from a place that you rarely, if ever, have interacted with, you know? So that's, again, when I read this from, from Malcolm, it's like, man, intellectual discourse sometimes comes with the cool kids crowd versus the outcasts. Yeah. And I think, you know, influence pays, plays a big part in whether or not a person or a tribe will be heard. Yep. So... When when we need to do, I believe, and in, in, you know, not to get preachy, but Don't I get think, preachy, Pastor. Hey, listen, man, I just tribalism is just one of those nagging inconsistencies with the scriptures. This idea that 
a certain group within the context of the family of God or the community of faith just is right mm. universally. Mm -hmm. You know, like they can conclude what should be known, what could be known authoritatively, and everybody else needs to just get down or lay down. Or that's just a euphemism of for saying that you just must trust us because we know what the gospel is saying. Right. And so that for us, I believe, is is a handicap to our witness and ultimately is inconsistent with the scriptures because it hampers our ability to actually show love for one another. Man, that's good. That's good. When you end up in these ghetto, ghetto ties <laughs> tribes where you're essentially stuck in some type of echo chamber. Mm hmm. And the only thing that you're hearing is essentially what you already believe mm -hmm. or what you would be prone to believe. Yeah. The reality is, is that you're not being sharpened. Mm -hmm. Like 100%. you're essentially being made a butter knife. Yep. Right. You're not, you're not really good for anything. Yep. And you're only cutting one way, right? You, yep. you, the only thing that you can cut is the easy stuff, right? Yes. Uh, but when it comes to something that requires rigorous intellectual engagement mm. and you're put in a place where people don't necess aren't necessarily prone to believe whatever it is that you're spewing, the reality is, is that you're going to wh whatever you're saying is usually going to fall on deaf ears, not because they can't hear, mm -hmm. but they can see oftentimes the intellectual dishonesty. Yeah. That's taking place. Yeah. And, yep. and because, again, you can create a narrative by misrepresenting people. You can create a narrative that seems to be right by essentially taking pieces, bits and pieces of what someone says mm -hmm. or taking being very selective with your facts. Yep. Right. That's why when people talk about like the data says, I'm like, first of all, <laughs> obviously, <data. laughs> obviously you haven't spent much time with data because you can yeah. make data say whatever you want data to say. Yeah. Right. You I'm a, I'm a marketer. Right. Yeah. I do surveys all the time. If I want a survey. <laughs> right. To come out saying yeah. something, I'm going to be very selective with the questions that mm -hmm. I ask. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So but if you're if you're a marketer who's serious about data. Mm -hmm. You're very, you have to sit down and you have to think very carefully to make sure that you help people get past their biases when you're asking questions, right? Yeah. So how can I get to the truth? There's a, there's a question that gets to an answer that's up here. And then there's a question that gets to the underlying like root cause. Mm -hmm. And you got to figure out what's that question every single time. Yes. If you want to get real data. Yes. And I've just found that guys, when, when, when they're engaging and when they're coming up with these arguments, there's a particular narrative that in an agenda that wants to be pushed mm -hmm. and that agenda is going to be pushed regardless of what the truth actually is. Yes. And it's, man. and it's unfortunate to watch it play out in Christian circles. Cause again, you find yourself in these echo chambers and that means that you're not really open to learning from the people on the other side of the aisle. Man. In order to claim any level of intellectual integrity, you have to read and Represent well those who disagree with you. Represent well those who disagree with you. Man, if you could <laughs> spend time teaching people the process by which you can faithfully employ that kind of an ethic, then I think it would it would take much longer than we could than we could measure or even anticipate to help people learn what that means. Like, so to represent someone that you clearly have a, a difference of perspective with mm -hmm. to represent them accurately, man. Um, I mean like that's, that just seems like an, an entire discipleship and, undertaking. And not just accurately, but like charitably to the point where whenever it's not clear what they're actually saying, you're going to assume the best man that's and that's that's the christian ethic that's the, exactly. the spirit's work in us to take that extra step and not just you know like you said write some perspective on a whiteboard and point to it but to engage with a person and say look man i'm going to assume the best about what you communicate i think some people they may try versions of that but it's eventually designed to cultivate a gotcha moment 
Mm -hmm. you know so you're 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 kind of coaxing them into this version of friendliness Mm -hmm. in the congregation in the the conversation just so you can hit them with the hammer yep (laughs) yep because after all you were charitable and and you you made them laugh or you you shot a friendly affirmation or a compliment their way but it's not truly to hear them or understand them it's to persuade them that you're right <laughs> right right it's not it's not to actually love them yeah exactly right as a human yep what what often is behind some of the intense tribalism that we see are very I think human; th- th- these are very human qualities that evoke compassion. It's behind the intense tribalism or the, the hefty arguments or the sharp words. Behind all of that are people who I think are afraid. Mm-hmm. Um, I think behind that are, there are people who are hurt, um, who have suffered as a result of broken relationships and right. broken trust. So even what you said, like taking an L— we look at that as as not just the argument is lost, but the cause is lost, mm. you know, where <laughs> maybe this public display of not having the right thing to say or not having the full perspective or enough information to respond is you losing and you looking like you're unprepared versus Maybe that public representation of taking an L, depending on how you extend this charity, Hmm. is the thing that wins the other person. Yeah. You know, it's just by stepping back and saying, hey, man, I don't think I'm I'm clear on some of the things that you're saying. Yep. Um, I want to take some time to think about that a little bit more before we continue to engage. Yep. Especially publicly. Yep. You know, and that's the trap of social media is there. There's no built in charity. There's no. a platform and there's an audience yep. and people perform for audiences. Yep. You know, like we're sitting here doing a podcast and I'm sure we're doing as best as we can to, to try to say the right thing mm-hmm. instead of what we would normally do if we were just having a regular conversation off the mic. Right. So it's 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 that next level of saying. I don't want to just win this argument, but I want to discern what this person is actually communicating yep. so that we can charitably engage and understand each other in such a way that models the kind of unity that I think completely collapses all of the division and the structures that typically keep us apart. That's good, man. That's really good. Now, with, with Malcolm, man, like, we continue to, to come back to this narrative of um, Malcolm versus King, Malcolm versus Dr. King, and, mm-hmm. and we're, we're going to have to take a separate episode to just truly, like, walk down the differences between the two men. Um, but, but what we, we do see, and I think where we're headed in some ways, is there's a convergence of their ideas. Later in their lives, they find that they have more in common than they have differences. They still have differences, mm-hmm. yeah. but there, there becomes a charitable conclusion to their relationship. Mm-hmm. What once was, and this was largely Malcolm throwing jabs publicly mm-hmm. to someone else, becomes a man who sits down and reconsiders everything. And that kind of stuff, again, that's not learned in a book. That's learned through life experience. Yep. So as Malcolm becomes disappointed and disillusioned with this religion Mm -hmm. that he has given his life over to and and things play out in such a way where he has to distance himself, he becomes open to a whole nother perspective of life and God. Yeah. That we we just saw the and we just saw the beginning of that. Right, right. We, Malcolm never got the opportunity to fully evolve because who's to say where he would have ended up? You yeah. know, twenty years later, thirty yeah. years later, and it's unfortunate we never got a chance to witness that because both he and King were the types of individuals that this generation, it feels like at least. God is God is sovereign. When a man's time is up, a man's time is up. Mm-hmm. But it, it feels as if, on some level, there was still more to learn yeah. from both of those individuals. Yeah, because they were still both died in their thirties. Yep, which is incredible to think. Just for for me personally, and you know, we were talking about this a little earlier. We know we don't think the same way we did when we were twenty two years old. 
like this this whole idea of of being intellectually honest that <laughs> practice evolves right over time and with whatever we have the capacity to understand in different stages of life yeah and because oftentimes you just gotta be wrong enough to realize dang dude i thought i had because when you're in your 20s man you think you know everything yep you're ready to teach folks some stuff yep and then all of a sudden you know the the cliches or the caricatures you know don't work anymore yep and you quickly realize that yo like i don't know as much as i thought i know yeah i knew and then you get married and you really realize how much you don't know because like when you're saying i mean and to, to some yeah. level if you're single and you're not intentional about community and this yeah. is almost anybody you can create this little echo chamber mm -hmm. then when you get married you get this new person in that's into the mix and they begin to challenge your core ideas and and so but even after a time Mm -hmm. Like your marriage, your household mm -hmm. could become an echo chamber. The reality is, is that you always got to make sure that you're connected to community. Yes. And con connected to other people who are willing to challenge you. Yes. And you got to invite that. When you, when, I, I, I realized this as somebody who has very strong convictions. Mm -hmm. I realized that I have to invite mm -hmm. challenge. Yes. I just can't assume that people are going to disagree with me or contradict me or, you know, I, I have to say, listen. Tear this apart. Yep. Please tear this apart. Here's what I think right now, but rip it apart. Help me. What, what do you all think? Where are my holes at? Where are my gaps at? Yeah. What we believe in terms of our identity in Christ is almost a progression of childlikeness where we are constantly evaluating what we know, what we think we know, and ultimately what we hope to learn, yeah. what God is teaching. Practical ways this plays out is... You know, in the scriptures, you've got Peter who has an idea about what the church is and what the church should be. Mm -hmm. And yet there is a person being risen up under completely different circumstances to actually write the majority of the New Testament. And when these two men converge, it's it's not because they share the same ideas right. about what should be done. And yet. Paul legitimately has a mandate from Christ to go and do something that the other apostles were not called and told to do in the same way. Right. You know, like Paul's specific mandate is like, look, you're going to suffer mm -hmm. in this proclamation of the gospel to the Gentiles. And Peter is still wrestling with his idea of what that looks like. Mm. Lived experience with Christ lived experience evangelizing ministering to Jews in the Jewish culture within that context meets Paul and pseudo agrees with this idea that the gospel is supposed to go to the whole world mm -hmm. yet when the moment comes for him to affiliate fully with that conviction Peter tries to have it both ways yeah. He tries to affiliate with Judaizers and say, oh, well, you know, you probably should get circumcised. <laughs> and then Paul has to, in his faith, he has to correct him right. publicly. So, I, but, but then the end of that story isn't Peter retreating to his tribalism. It's him writing charitably about Paul later and saying, you guys should listen to Paul. Mm -hmm. A lot of the things that he has to say may be hard to understand, but this brother knows mm. the same Christ that I follow. So we don't we don't play with that charity. We don't make political posts to seem like we have this relationship with really behind the scenes. We're not feeling these guys and we never would really kick it with them anyway. Mm. But this this unity that's crafted by the spirit causes us to converge in ways that open us up to learn more fully what God is teaching us. That's so, good. I mean, I'm look, bro, I, Malcolm, Malcolm is just that guy. I think that within the context of organized religion, even like the way that tribes start to form, yeah. um, what is Christianity becomes <laughs> a, a subject of debate. Mm -hmm. Like what even Malcolm concluded about Christianity, which we'll talk about later, mm -hmm. the critiques become valid and then you start to ask these questions, and I'm not saying I'm, I'm fully resolved to this notion, but you start to begin to ask questions about what in a person like Malcolm X's life models the ethic that we believe. 
You know, like mm. th- this, what we're reading in this quote, this mm-hmm. is an ethic that we believe, yeah. you know, something that Christ taught. Mm-hmm. So if you're, you're going to, like we talked about earlier, you're going to shut down Malcolm X and say, no, he's just altogether harmful. Then you'll lose a powerful example that ultimately should inform our identity as believers. Yeah, that's good. I mean, let's talk about the search for truth. And the snare of deception. If I if I could be uh, <laughs> be direct here, <laughs> what's what's more important in our time now? Like you know, like is and and I know that this is this is a bad question on his face. Like, but what's more important, the search for truth or exposing deception? So when I when I say the snare of deception, I guess what what I mean is I think I can't help but think about the show Baraka quote: "So open minded that your brains fall out." Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. As a Christian, the scriptures have to be your guide. One hundred percent. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. So I guess what I'm ultimately trying to to get at that there is there there's a person that searches for truth that never actually because this is different from Malcolm, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I, and I think this is helpful. There's a person who searches for truth, but they never have any firm convictions. Mm. But they're always on this never-ending search for truth. Yeah, tossed to and fro. Yep, by every wind of doctrine. Yes, exactly. So I think that it has to be made clear not not for us, not to us, not between us, but for those who are listening mm-hmm. to make sure that they hear what we're saying and what we're not saying. Yeah, you need to have firm convictions, mm-hmm. but you need to allow yourself to be challenged. Yes, you need to allow yourself. You need to have enough humility to step back and listen, mm-hmm. right? Because what you believe is the truth, if, even if the scriptures are your final authority, perhaps it's not that the scriptures aren't truth, aren't true. Perhaps you've misinterpreted or misunderstood the scriptures. Yeah. And, and that goes back to your point about community being in a space with people who will challenge you. According to the scriptures, if you're not going to do the work to study the scriptures, study to show yourself approved and understand to the best of your ability with seeking uh, what God's word is actually teaching us, then how could you be equipped even in a public forum or private forum to argue or contend for the faith? You know, in, in your own mind, maybe you say, I'm contending for the truth or I'm contending against deception. But if you haven't done the work of studying the scriptures to actually form that foundation from which you spring from in engaging with any idea, then, yeah, I mean, then your ground's going to be shaky, you know, and, and you're going to you you may be that person that becomes tempted to just exist in the land of ambiguity and say like, well, you know, I think I can gain. No, there is a rock that you can stand on in the scriptures, in the word of God that helps you navigate with with everything, mm-hmm. and navigate every kind of idea. Mm-hmm. And that's the fear thing that I was talking about earlier is I think yeah. there are folks who are truly, they're afraid that if they step or venture into ideas outside of their tribe, yep. that somehow that's a departure from the gospel. Yep. That's because they, they live in no sand. They man. think, they think, listen, and here's the thing, man. So I, I had this happen to me this is a perfect example. So when guys, you know, first come into reform theology, they tend to read and regurgitate more theological conclusions mm. than scripture. Yeah. And not that those theological conclusions are necessarily wrong, but they have this appearance of knowledge. Yep. It's, it's posturing more than anything else. Posturing. Case in point, I tweeted a few weeks ago or maybe a few, maybe a couple of weeks ago. A husband protects his wife from external threats by defending her. Mm-hmm. A husband protects his wife mm. from internal threats. And I put in parentheses, even himself, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. by empowering her. Mm-hmm. Now, a guy who is in sort of the Calvinist circles said, instead of promoting worldly philosophies like this, man, we should simply just love our wife. Like what, Paul says in Ephesians. Hold on, man. But that's what that's my point, though, Phil, is that when you're when you're so devoted to your tribe, 
you you run the risk of actually walking away from the faith you say you stand for. Mm-hmm. You walk away from the faith when you walk away from the scriptures. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. So if you can't even exegete a text based off of, of something very elementary, you know what you're saying? Like, I'm not I'm not hearing some complicated theory that you're throwing out there for controversy's sake. No. Depending on how sensitive the tribe is to those words that you used, you could be labeled a charismatic fanatic for saying. It doesn't matter. The scriptures say power. <laughs> and, and this particular tribe has a huge problem. With misogyny. And and there it is. There it is. The tree is known by its fruit. You know, and, and at the end of the day, as it relates to what truth is, I think that there's there's something to truth that, you know, unsettles us because of how definitive it is. Mm-hmm. And and yet it should secure us and actually form our our sense of, of protection and confidence. Because it is true, after all, you know, like it's not something that can change with the winds of society or perspective. What you're saying, like that's such a deep truth that, you know, whatever people's concerns are or fears that they may be projecting on you, it doesn't change the truth. You know, nope. it's what it's like for me, the, the example in the scripture r- r- around this that always gets me is Pilate's response to Jesus. Because Jesus is essentially communicating to him that I'm here because I'm the I am the truth. I am the one who is sharing the truth and inviting people into the truth. Right. And for him to be so definitive in saying that in that way, mm-hmm. it threw Pilate off. Yep. And he was he was afraid. He, yep. Everything about what he thought was real was was being shaken right to the point where in his high office he's asking the guy who he has the power to execute what is truth he's having a philosophical conversation or inviting one in a moment where it doesn't make sense so there's something about truth that i think can be known can be observed can be measured and thank god that christ doesn't mince words about the truth he makes it very clear that it's in me. Right. Right. <laughs> I am the truth. Right. Listen to what I say and follow it. And and man, like if we stick right there, then we find ourselves equipped to engage with any idea. Mm. I'm I love that's, good. that's the kind of confidence I want to have about that's my good. Christianity. Yep. Is that somebody can engage me with some crazy idea, mm-hmm. but standing on the truth and studying the scriptures. Yes, you gotta study them. I can then employ Holy Spirit discernment in the way that I engage with everything, which may mean I need to engage this idea head on, or it may mean that I need to take an L, you know, because the truth is not just the argument. The truth is that this person may be dealing with something Mm -hmm. that is not going to be solved by me embarrassing them publicly, Mm -hmm. you know, so. And also, too, you have to having to realize that. While you are an ambassador for the scriptures, you better be very careful about what you say bro. on behalf of God. Um, if you're in a, if you God's ambassador, bro. If we are if we if we are ambassador for Christ, we have to be very careful that we are saying what he has commissioned us to say. I, so that means sometimes we just got to be quiet God. when we don't know the answer. Well, you just you you went right where I wanted to go, at least in, in just kind of making the point in conclusion. What what we're describing in long form is humility. Yep. You know, it's the long form breaking down of the posture of humility. We have to consider others before ourselves. We have to be quick to listen, slow to speak. And that's the work of God in us for us to approach things in this way. So, again, I appreciate what Malcolm says because he he does hold to his firm convictions, but he's willing to listen, to re-engage with something or someone to observe facts, you know. And so (laughs) for for those who are really on the wait for the facts train, you better be all facts. You know, what is the full scope? Mm-hmm. of truth yep yep it's more than just a fact here or a fact there yes you you gotta take the facts and then you gotta draw a conclusion 
Taylor, enjoyed just having this conversation with you, man. This was so helpful. We got to wrap this up because you got a plane to catch, bro. I do, man, but we're going to be having more. We just cracked this open, so I look forward to more conversation. Likewise. Thanks for joining us this week on Make It Plain. Make sure to visit our website at makeitplain.co. That's makeitplain.co, where you can subscribe to the show in Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Audible, or wherever you get your podcasts so you never miss an episode. If you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on Apple Podcasts, or if you simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. If you like this show, you might want to check out the autobiography of Malcolm X and consider joining our Patreon group, Home to Roost, where we're discussing his autobiography from a Christian perspective twice a month. Speaking of our Patreon community, a big shout out to each and every one of our Patreon supporters. You help make this show possible. Be sure to tune in next week for our next episode. Until then, let's continue the conversation via social media. A link to all of our social media accounts can be found at makeitplain.co. So that was Phil and Taylor with Make It Plain and Malcolm's Intellectual Integrity. Uh, Again, if you haven't done that already, make sure you go over and subscribe to their feed and uh, get ready for season two here coming the 21st. Find out more at makeitplain.co. Enjoy. And they'll catch you next time on Make It Plain. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, the end? Good? Cool, 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 cool. Stopping recording now.